Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. You know, they got great instant film, three and a quarter by four and a quarter, four by five, color black and white, and of course, the new Instex is here in the country now. Besides all the great chrome, black and white, C41 color and eggs, just a lot of great stuff going on. Fuji, check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends over at Richard Photo Lab, a great place to send, of course, all of your black and white killer chrome lab. These guys do beautiful work, C41 print scan, used by a lot of great professional photographers worldwide. They're in Hollywood, California. Check them out, richardphotolab.com and Upstrap. The camera strap that will not let the camera slide off your shoulder. You can check them out. Al's doing great work. Upstrap pro.com and our media partners are the Analog Photography User Group, where you can find out all things about the traditional photographic process from wet plate, tin type, emulsion making, film, you name it, everything going on. www.apug.org. We got a great show today we have with us Rodney Lowe Jr. Rodney is a professional landscape photographer. He has the most beautiful work you'd ever want to see. He's got galleries in Portland, San Francisco, Sausalito, Minneapolis, new one coming in Vegas. He's a Fuji Talent Team Elite Pro member. A lot of stuff going on with Rodney. He has some beautiful work. You can check him out at his website over at The Low Road. It's T-H-E-L-O-U-G-H-R-O-A-D.com. Rodney, how you doing today? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Great. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk to us about yourself, your photography, and what you've been up to. So, Rodney, why don't you give us a little background on yourself so listeners know about Rodney Lowe and what you've been doing. I guess I'm what you would call a corporate dropout. I did the traditional thing. I went to college and got my degrees and then went into the corporate world. And I like to think that I'm not the lowest rabbit around the track. And I know how to talk geek. I know how to talk corporate. And I went up the ladder pretty quick. I'd have one of my photos hanging in my office from time to time, and people would come in, comment how beautiful it was, where was it that they could get it. I said, what do you mean? I I made that. Oh, you didn't make that. Yeah, I did, honest. Finally, I heard enough of it that I decided to strike out on my own. And now we've got four galleries and another one open up next year in Las Vegas. That's kind of how it started. People telling me that I ought to go do it. Wow. So what got you involved in photography to start with? You started doing this when you were a kid, high school. How did you sort of get the photography bug? When I was about 12 years old, my father's best friend, Bill, Uncle Bill, I'm sure we all have an Uncle Bill in our family somewhere, was an amateur photographer. He used to take chromes, 35 millimeter chromes, and he would sell them to note card companies. And I always thought it was fascinating. So he gave me his old beat up 35 millimeter OM-1 camera eons ago showed me how to load my own black and white film, and then my first dark room was the bathroom where I would literally turn on the light switch to expose little prints. <laughs> it was kind of sad, but that was it right there. Well, I mean, there you go. You're making contact prints in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. get much better than that. I wonder what those are worth today. Hey, if you could find them. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. So did you pursue more photography education through high school or college, or was it just pretty much you were just playing around and had to progress to the point to where you were like, okay, I'm ditching the corporate monkeys, I'm gone? You know what happened was I always used photography to chronicle my trips. My father was an avid outdoorsman, and I think the very first trip I ever went with him um, backcountry was when I was about six years old. So for me, hiking and climbing and hunting and fishing and and all these things that a young man does, boy, I guess it was just a way for me to chronicle what I did, to chronicle the adventure, to come back and look and see where I had been and to remember what I had done. And it had always been fun. And that's the way it needs to remain, I think. I mentioned how I left the corporate world to start our little adventure here. And when I first left the corporate world, all the time prior to that, I had photographed things that I loved things that moved me, things that I liked, and it evoked a response from everybody else for whatever reason. I mean, I don't know why it did. Well, when I left the corporate world, I started photographing things that I thought would sell. Guess what happened? They, <laughs> they didn't sell. No. And so I said, well, maybe I ought to go back to doing things the way I'd always done it, which was I'm just going to photograph things that I like. If other people like it, great. And if they don't, well, okay, they don't. So that's what I've gone back to my original model, if you will, which was photograph things that you think are cool. So what were you shooting that you thought people would buy versus what you are shooting now? That's really hard to describe. It was sort of the cliche shots, reflection of the mountain and the water and 
the, the log going out into the water with the trees on the outside. It was sort of formulaic, I think. I didn't know. I, I wasn't smart, if you will. I didn't go out and look to see what other people were photographing. I literally just photographed thinking, oh, well, look at that. That obviously will sell. And I wish I could give exact examples other than the reflection kind of thing, but it didn't work for whatever reason. They might have been really beautiful images, although they didn't sell, which would suggest maybe they weren't. So it's always gone back to that same basic thing. Walk around until you go, oh, wow, look at that. There's a visceral response. There's something inside that yells to every fiber of my being, that's amazing, and then take your time to photograph it. Like you just said, you're walking around, you're out in the back, and you're in the middle of nowhere. I'm assuming based off of your previous response just now, you could walk around for quite a while until you hit that moment. That's right. A very good friend of mine, his name is George Ward. He's a professional photographer out there. One of the things that he's always said is photography, especially landscape photography, is almost more of an athletic sport than it is an artistic endeavor. To hike into the backcountry, it's tough, especially with a lot of gear on your back. You have to carry all the stuff that you need to survive, and then you've got to carry all your gear. I mean, when I go out with an 8x10 camera and four film holders and a couple boxes of film and all the little gadgetry that I need to get stuff done, I mean, we're looking at, gosh, I've got to be pushing 100, 110 pounds. That's a lot of gear. Yeah, to strap that on your back and then, like you said, go adventure because you're not just driving, hopping out of your car at a parking rest spot and shooting a photo. Well, of course, there's some of that, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully, to, the more the better, right? You have to be dumb <laughs> to go by the Snake River Overlook. It's amazingly beautiful, or Schwabucker's Landing. Right. These are stunningly beautiful locations that are easy to get to. Unfortunately, though, there is no correlation to miles hiked and great images captured. I have one image. It's called Enlightenment. It is in Kings Canyon. It's 12 miles in, up over a 12,000-foot mountain pass. Woke up the next morning with a dusting of snow on everything looked at the topo map and realized that about two miles off trail was another lake. And I just kind of looked. It's all high escarpment type rocks everywhere. And I just looked and said, oh, it's over there. Let's go. And I hiked over there. And it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. If I was just hiking the trail, I would have never thought that. So this one piece is 14, 15 miles one direction to get to at 11,000 feet. This is not a drive your car up. Oh, let's say, how would we put this? This isn't a honey, slow your car down moment. No. <laughs> honey, slow yeah. down, just a minute, click. Okay, we can go now. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, well, like you said, the easiest things to capture are great sometimes, but the stuff that's really killer is off the beaten path. I think you have to go dig for it because it's not just on a little trail that says, here, you guys can just hike this and it's a level two and this is nice and easy. Good things usually well, cost a lot and are hard to get to. And you also get to see things that most people don't. I have another image that's called Kingdom of Mountains in the wrangell St. Elias National Preserve up in Alaska. It's 75 miles back, part of a three-week backcountry hike. 75 miles back. And it's stunning. These aren't spots like the Snake River Overlook or Schwabuckers Landers where everybody knows where they exist and everybody goes there and they just wait for a beautiful morning. These are images that are likely to never be seen by hardly anyone else. I mean, the one out in Wrangell, I earned that one, I guess. How do you plan on these trips? Before we get into gear here and techie stuff, how do you plan on a trip? It's like, okay, I've never been here before. There might be something visually appealing here. How do you sort of plan on how Rodney's going to go trip off for weeks out in the middle of nowhere? You know, that's a great question. I get asked that question a lot, and it usually comes along with the same question of, I'm an aspiring photographer. How can I market and sell my work? You're great and successful, Rodney, but how does somebody else do it? I basically tell them, you can do exactly what I did, which was I went to these little outdoor art festivals, and I started locally, and then it went to regionally, and then it went to nationally, and then I kept winning award after award after award. Finally, I said, well, maybe I ought to open up my own retail location. Fantastic photographers like Thomas Mangelson have done it, so what one man can do, another man can do. And so I used to employ what I called hit-and-run photography, which was if I'm on my way from Seattle to Minneapolis, I would stop off and maybe duck into the Badlands or something like that. But I could only afford one sunset, one evening, one sunrise. Maybe I was lucky enough I had a couple days I could stay, but certainly not what I have today. Today I'm afforded as much time as I want. 
So now I just sit around the house dreaming about hiking and where do I want to go and what's the best time to go? Where have I not been? And literally it's planning like you would plan anything else. Except now I can say, am I going to stay a week? Is this going to be a three-month trip? What am I going to do? Depends on the location, whether or not the flowers are blooming or the aspens are still beautifully colored or the wind came through and wiped them out. Now it's time to move on. Mother Nature is the fickle bitch. She can really put you in your place. And one season, it's stunning. It's the best you've seen in 15 years. You go back the next year, and it's the worst you've ever seen. So the whole concept of you can't go back, photograph while you're there, is absolutely true. But to plan when that's going to happen, boy, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know what Mother Nature is going to throw at me. Now, the places you're going and you're hiking into, is this something you could actually, let's say, load a bunch of gear up on a horse and make it easier on yourself? Or this is actually true, pretty much off the map, you're just going wherever the compass takes you? I think I'm probably just a dumb guy because (laughs) I started off hiking with my dad in the backpack. It just got to be more gear, more gear, more gear, and I just got used to it. The older I get, you'd think the wiser I'd get. But I still have yet to do a trip that's on horseback or with goats or with llamas. I mean, there's lots of guys out there who do that, and I applaud them. I envy them (laughs) at some point. I mean, I've got no gigantic bravado about carrying around gigantic camera gear into the wilderness. I mean, that's not really what I'm all about. I'm just about getting the image. And if I could make it easier on myself, absolutely. Do you have some llamas for sale? (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm out of the llama business right now. But, you know, it's just a thought that I think the point is, is you're going into areas where you probably couldn't even take a horse. There's a lot of trails where you can't ride a horse. I mean, a horse will go a lot of places, but some places they won't go. Absolutely. For example, that shot in Kings Canyon we were talking about earlier. Yeah, you could probably make it horseback. The horse could make it up the trail just fine. However, the moment you go off trail, those rocks are dangerous. You would not want to take an animal across there. Maybe a goat, maybe a llama, but certainly not a horse. And you're right. I mean, if you're making your way up some little creek ravine and you're bushwhacking it and you're sweating buckets, you can't ride an animal through there or drag a team of goats or llama. They wouldn't follow. So maybe the best thing to do would create a base camp and then do day hikes out from there or something. That's what I was going to hit on next. What's the thought of loading all the gear up in a chopper and taking it out to base camp so it doesn't take you a week to walk in? Well, you know, I specialize in national parks, national monuments, and what I like to call other beautiful places. A lot of these are wilderness areas. You're not allowed to drop a helicopter in there. Typically, most of the time, only way you can get in there is by foot. Right. Otherwise, if you drop them with a chopper, there'd be another chopper behind you, so you don't want that. And then all of a sudden, that (laughs) kind of destroys the wilderness experience, doesn't it? Yeah, it defeats the purpose to a point. I've been in the middle of nowhere in Voyagers National Park, and it's as quiet as quiet can be, and then all of a sudden you hear this airplane, and you can see it at night. You see the little lights blinking, and it's got to be, I don't know, 100 miles away, it seems like, but you can still hear it. Can't we have a no-fly zone over wilderness areas (laughs) and national parks? Let's start a little list that have everybody sign on it. That's the thing. It's so quiet, and you're in the middle of nowhere, and there's no lights, and there's all the starlight, and it's really quiet. And you hear a jet at 40,000 foot flying over. Yeah, don't you wish you had a Sam? (laughs) Well, I'm joking, of course. I hope everyone knows that. Well, yeah, but it sort of breaks the whole experience of like, okay, I really am out with nature and completely isolated. And then all of a sudden, here comes an Airbus A320 buzzing by. Thanks. Right. It's certainly not the wilderness experience our great-grandparents or even our grandparents had experienced. No, but I'm sure there's still places you go where jets don't even fly over. I have been to a few of those. Ironically, you still find tin cans and glass bottles. You're standing in some place that you think nobody's ever been. You're the first human to ever be there, and then you'll come across something. You'll be like, you've got to be kidding me. Who in their (laughs) right mind would come out here? Oh, wait, I'm here. (laughs) So, Rodney, let's talk about the gear. Let's talk about what you use to capture images. I know you're shooting large format. You're a Fuji Talent Team Elite member. Of course, you're on the great master's list over at Yahoo. Let's talk about your photography itself. Let's get the technical here about what you're shooting. You're shooting everything on film. I am. I use an Arca Swiss 8x10 F-line camera. It's a monorail system, which you wouldn't think would be really good for field use. 
but ironically, it works out to be fantastic. It's got what's called yaw-free movement, so I don't have to adjust the center point, basically, of where the lens falls on the film plane. It collapses down to, gosh, maybe three and a half inches wide. It's ultra lightweight. Put it on a small little four inch rail and shove it in my backpack. It's fantastic. I am using Fujifilm, Fuji Ostia 100F. Absolutely love the film. It's got a finer grain structure than Velvia. It has much broader latitude in the shadow details. I think it's pushing close to a stop, stop and a half brighter than Velvia 50 or even wow. Velvia 100. So it's a great film. If you're shooting landscapes, you ought to be shooting this film. We have the Argus Swiss gear, of course, using the Fuji Chrome. Let's talk about lenses, glass. There's a lot of schools of thought out there. The more lenses you have, the more productive you're going to be versus the fewer lenses, you're not likely to be as productive. I know that there's a lot of people that would love to debate that issue forever. I am basically lazy. I'll admit it right now in front of everybody, I'm the laziest photographer on the planet. So I do not want to carry a ton of gear. I, for the past five years, have only shot with two lenses. I had a Fujinon 300 millimeter and I had a Schneider 150 super wide. And I absolutely love those lenses. The 300 is equivalent to a 150 on 4x5, so it's slightly wide. The 150 is the equivalent of a 75 on 4x5, so it's very wide. So I had slightly wide and very wide. I would say 95% of everything I shoot is with the 300 millimeter. Only this last fall did I go out and purchase another lens, which was a 480 Schneider also. Absolutely beautiful pieces of glass. I love these lenses. The 480 probably weighs about five pounds. (laughs) At least it seems like it's like a dumbbell, you know, you could use it exercising. And depending on what I'm going to go shoot, I will just carry two of them. I typically don't carry all three of them. Besides the glass, I've got five film holders that I'm carrying. If I'm just out doing a day hike, I'll go super lightweight. I'll carry my carbon fiber MK2 Gitso. The two lenses or three lenses, if it's just I'm going to go out for seven, eight miles one way, seven, eight miles coming back for a day hike with the film holders and the camera and the tripod and my little, what I call, goodie bag. And in the goodie bag, got a graduated neutral density filter, got a Sekonic Zoom Master 508, I think. Great spot meter, incident meter combination. You get up to 10 data points into it and average multiple data points. Really, really nice. And uh, shutter release. That's about it. I mean, I don't really carry a whole lot of stuff. I don't have any filters. I don't have a polarizer. If I'm shooting black and white, I'll bring a red filter. You know, I mean, that's it. Real basic stuff. So let's talk about once you're back at the shop, you're back in your studio, you've been on the trip, you have a bunch of exposed chrome. What happens then? Each composition, a film holder holds two sheets, one front, one back. Every time I click, it's pretty expensive. So I'm pretty sure before I just start ripping up dollar bills, I will separate them out into individual boxes with the field notes for each shot. Sometimes in the field, you got to play tricks, if you will. If it's a little windy and you really needed two seconds for the exposure, maybe you go to one second with a note to yourself, push it in processing one stop, things of that nature. So all those notes are taken in the field and transferred onto each little, it's a triple box, and each composition is put into each one with its field notes. Then I separate those out into whether or not they need to be processed, normal, push, pull, in little piles. And I send them down, and we go down and we process them. E6, dip and dunk, refrima. We've got a rack system, deep tanks. It's really a nice system. No agitation marks whatsoever. I love it. It's fantastic. Do you find, Rodney, that you're shooting enough chrome to keep the chemistry up on the dip and dunk and have all that work out? Or do you have to sort of redo everything every time you get ready to run a batch? Oh, no. There's enough going through there that we don't have any problems. Realize this is not my Refrema. I wish it were. Oh, okay. Uh, it's uh, a local lab, and so yeah, they got plenty going through there. But oh, okay. It's a fantastic system. It's a Kodak Q lab. They maintain their stuff impeccably, which they're one of the few on the West Coast that's still doing large format film E6 processing. Long time ago, I discovered that I might know how to photograph them, but I don't know how to pick them. And what I mean by that is I have no idea which ones the public are going to like. 
So when I get back from a trip, all the film has been processed, and I separate out what I think is the good from the bad, I put it all into one big pile, and I gather everybody in the studio around me. And all I do is I just put them on the light table one by one, and I listen at the comments. And it's interesting because one person here at the studio is sort of what I would call the old lady vote. Whatever that person loves, every old lady in the world loves. Then there's the hipster guy. and Whatever he loves, every hipster out there is going to love it. So I wait until they all kind of go, oh, wow, look at that one. And then I'm feeling pretty good that that might actually be a good one. <laughs> well, like you said, you're covering such diverse markets. And where your studio is at, we'll talk about here in a minute. You need to get something that's going to please everybody because you can't have 3,000 images in a studio, in a gallery. Exactly. It is a business, right? We're trying to feed the kids. We've got the orthodontics bills to pay, you know, things like that. But still the base premise of I'm going to photograph what I love and hopefully it will connect with other people. The more people that you can connect with, the better your odds are in having a successful business. So in listening to the comments for the people here at the studio, it just helps me narrow it down a little bit. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't have photographed it to begin with. And if other people like it, then maybe that's one we ought to hang on the wall. Every now and then, I'll see something I love and none of them like. And they'll be like, eh, it's okay, eh. I'll be like, no, no, this one's great. It's just because I think it's great. And because your name's above the door, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so I say, no, I'm going to do this one. And every now and then, I'm dead on. It's great. Everybody loves it. More often than not, I might know how to shoot them, but I don't know how to peg them. <laughs> yeah. Well, like you said, you had to make yourself happy to start with. Yeah, exactly. I did try that one time. You know, let's photograph what I think will sell. Didn't work. I'm just going to go back and do what I've always done, and that works. So then once I get done separating out what I think are the acceptable ones, then I, I just narrow it down further, just like anybody else does. You sit there, and you look, and you wonder, and you think, and how is this one going to print? Well, those colors are so far out there. Even if I printed it as accurate as I can, no one's going to believe it, and I don't think I can even reproduce it properly, so we'll just set that one off till the technology catches up. You make all those sort of judgment calls, technical judgment calls. Once I have it narrowed down to the two or three that I think are absolutely phenomenal, I actually have three drum scanners in the studio. I have two color getter eagles made by Optronics, absolutely fantastic pieces of equipment. And then I've got my own Tango drum scanner, Linotype Hell Tango. I'll make a gigantic drum scan of it, 1.2 to 1.6 gig, which is a big file. Now, with people that are doing their own 4x5 and 8x10, and of course, they can't afford a Tango. Have you played around anything with using flatbed scanner, wet mount, adjustable focus, or is it pretty much if you're going to go to this kind of trouble that even if you don't have the gear, send it out to get a drum scan done? Yeah, I'm one of those I have more than I probably need kind of guys. A great question that we probably should answer is why 8x10? That's a beast. Why bother with that? Why not do the top end digital camera? I went through the same progression that most of us went through. I started with 35 millimeter, and then I went to medium format, which is nothing more than a big 35 millimeter. And then I saw a print from somebody who was shooting 4x5, and I went, ah, look at the detail. That's amazing. Then I went to 4x5, and then I saw a print from somebody who was doing 8x10. I went, oh, my gosh, look at the detail. Well, I have to go to 8x10. And so that's how I progressed to the 8x10 point. Because I want that magnificent detail, that means shooting with a large piece of film. And honestly, digital is just not there yet. I mean, I have no bravado. The moment they can give me a credit card size device that can capture 1.2 gig in under a third of a second <laughs> at 28, I'll be happy. But we're not there yet. I mean, could you imagine just having like a little sliver thing in your back pocket hiking out there? Woo, boy. I, <laughs> talk about easy. Oh, my gosh. I think the best you can get now is you can shoot 4x5 scan back. And even the top of the line scan bag took to a new Mac laptop. You're still talking, what, a 30-second scan? Yeah. I mean, that's a long time. Tell the ocean wave to pause. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stay there while this scans. <laughs> have you ever seen one of those scanning bags? And I'm not knocking digital. I don't want anyone to think I'm doing that. But have you ever seen it with the little spikies from the ocean wave? Oh, yeah. Really freaky looking. It looks natural, doesn't it? Right. Not. I'm sure I'm going to catch heck for that later. Well, that's okay. I mean, we're all here. We're talking analog. So really, I think that a lot of people have gone digital and they're going back to film. They're not happy with the upgrade path. I mean, let's say you're shooting 35 millimeter. Well, guess what? 
it's three to five, eight thousand dollars every eighteen months mm-hmm. to buy a new camera to keep up with the stuff. Yep. And you know, every generation keeps getting better and better, but it's a lot of dough over and over and over. Right. How many trips could you make with that kind of money? A lot. And then on top of that is, do I want to just waste the rest of my life away in Photoshop? Not me. Yeah. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you are doing a hybrid workflow. We all know while we're shooting eight by 10, it's just the bigger the negative, the more information, the more detail, right. the more you can store on your original capture. So you shot the eight by 10, you're using Chrome. Once you scan this in, let's talk about what happens there. Well, then we got basically a one to two gigabyte raw file, if you want to think about it that way. I've got a master's degree in statistics and mathematics, so at my heart, I'm a geek. And I'm sure you guys know the name Joseph Holmes, very good friend of mine. He's taught a few people how to do color calibration and how to profile, and I'm one of those guys. And I thank him for it. He's my master of color. (laughs) (laughs) He calls me grasshopper. When we finally bury Joe in the ground, we're going to have to put on his tombstone, Here Lies Joe Holmes. He knew everything. The guy, he's like super smart. I don't like to think I'm stupid, but I will admit he's smarter than me in a lot of areas. And I think I'm only smarter than he is in a few. (laughs) He's a great photographer too, yeah. He is a great photographer. We've profiled everything in-house. We've profiled the scanners. You know, I've got my own light jet. We've profiled that. So yeah, I get this gigantic scan. It has large a color space as we can possibly get out of the scanner. We work in that original color space. We do everything that we would have done traditionally in the dark room. I stayed in the dark room until about 1997, 1998. And that was when I started transitioning over to this sort of dual hybrid kind of mode. Started when I was 12 in the dark room. So everything dodging, burning, color corrections, color contrast mass, contrast mass gradient contrast math. You name it, in a traditional darkroom, I've pretty much done it. To be able to employ that expertise on this scan, my goal has always been to get back to what I saw. How I get there, I don't really care. I just want to be able to tell people that's what it was like when I was standing there. That's what I saw. And that's why I was moved. All have the difficulty as artists of walking around and we have this vision in our head, oh, if I could only find that leaf on a log or whatever it is, and we stumble upon it and we go, ah, that's it, that's amazing. That's the beauty of nature and landscapes that I've been searching for. And then we photograph it. That's just step one. Step two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or how do I get it on the wall so somebody else can have that same experience? That, I think, ultimately is the goal. So my goal has always been to get back to what I saw. I really don't care how I do it. I just want to know that it's as best as it can be done, and that's what it looked like when I was standing there. So if I go from an 8x10 with a gigantic scan, and I do everything I would have done traditionally in a dark room, except now I can do it with a higher level of precision inside of something like Photoshop, I say, why not? From there, we convert it to output, depending on how we're going to print it. Are we going to print it on a trans? Are we going to print it on flex? Are we going to print it on an inkjet printer? just depends on how we're going to print it and what size. So let's talk about the print deal. So what do you see most of your stuff's done in a high gloss Fuji material? Do you typically do a crystal archive? Are you playing around with the pearlescence metallic looking stuff? Maybe more inkjet? Is the image itself sort of delegates what material you're going to print this on? I want my images to be around for as long as they can be around. But I need to balance it with a look that I can live with and something that can hang on the wall without what we'll call maintenance. And what I mean by that is inkjets have a habit, even after being dried, of outgassing because of the humectant that carries the little droplet of ink onto the paper, especially a problem on RC-based papers. So you get this ghosting effect that comes back onto the inside of the glass. Yeah, they last a long time, but you've got maintenance problems with them. I still prefer Fuji Crystal Archive Flex, which is the equivalent, and I know I'm using that term loosely, to Supergloss. That's what I used to print traditionally in Type R Supergloss in the darkroom. I loved it. I loved the look. I loved the luster of it. I loved the depth of the color. Just everything about it I loved. So when Fuji Flex came out, I immediately migrated back to that. And it's a great material. I mean, polyester backing, you can mount it without any orange peeling. It just looks fantastic. So that's what we're using. Primarily, that's 99% of everything we do is that. 
Yeah, it's great looking stuff. And like you said, with the color of your images and what you're doing, this stuff which must be really incredible to see this in person. There's a depth to it that you can't really describe. You have to experience it. And you're right. If you were here at the studio, we could roll one out on the table for you and you would just be amazed. I mean, they look great behind glass. But if you can physically look at the raw surface of the photograph before it's ever mounted or framed behind glass, it's a cool thing. It really is. It's stunning. The luster to it is just stunning. Fuji had one hanging in their booth at Photo Plus, and it was very stunning. It was mounted, but it wasn't behind glass, and it was just like, wow. Oh, that's right. They have one of mine called Passing Through. This is the only gripe I have. Why can't they make it bigger? (laughs) They only make this stuff 50 inches. Right. And they say it's because of the supplier that they get the material from. I mean, oh, give me a 70-inch, 80-inch material. Huh. Well, first of all, you could only go 72, I suppose, 70 inches because then processors aren't available. But still, 70 inches by, what would that be? Somebody get out their calculator for me. I mean, that's got to be pushing, what, 70 by 90? Yeah, about that, yeah. That's huge. That'd be great that's looking, massive. though. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, from 8 by 10, it'd be fantastic. Now, what they have there, they asked if they could use this image in their booth, and I said, absolutely, by all means, please do. And we mounted it up for them, and we sent it out to them, and they have a 50 by 62 and a half of an image called Passing Through, which is a shot of Fly Geyser in Nevada out in the middle of nowhere. Turned yeah. out okay? I haven't seen it. It's beautiful. The booth. Yeah, it looked really good. Good. So, Ronnie, let's talk about, you've got all this stuff done, you've mounted your images. Do you sell these in your galleries, completely mounted framed as a takeaway? Do you leave the option up to the person buying it? And how do you do your finished product? Or is it like, no, this is my print. This is my vision of what I saw. This is how I want it to be displayed and sold. If you walk into one of our existing four galleries, and like I said, we're opening up one next year in Las Vegas. If you walk into one of the galleries, you have an option. I mean, not everybody likes the way I frame stuff. We call it the artist series. The reason that pieces are framed that way is because that's the way I like it. This is the way I like it presented this way. I want people to see it. And that's the way we sell it as an artist series frame. But if you don't like my frame, but you like the matting, you can get it matted. And if you don't like the matting, you just like the image, and you can get it loose. My thing is I want you to be able to bring these into your home. I want them to instill a sense of peace, harmony, a love of nature and wild things. I want it to be an escape from people's normal lives, to know that there is beauty out there beyond their cubicle, that the beauty typically just begins right outside of city limits. They can get it however they want. Let's talk about your gallery. So you've got the prints done, they're mounted, they're framed, however you want to buy it. Where do people go look at your stuff at? Where can they see it? I know you have some stuff in San Francisco, but you have, like you said, some more galleries. You've got a new one coming in Vegas. You're actually moving it into this retail gallery environment. We have the studio that we originally had up here in Portland. We've recently moved this spring into a new facility. It's 9,000 square feet. It's a beautiful studio, and people can come here and look at the work and purchase work. This was sort of the original one, and the one that followed after that was a little teeny but beautiful gallery in Sausalito, California, what they like to call the Mediterranean-like seaside village of Sausalito. And it is. It really is a cool little place. Right downtown next to Starbucks is the Wilderness Collections Gallery. Then we also have a gallery over on Pier 39 in San Francisco. That is probably the best example of my body of work. It's a 5,500-square-foot gallery. It's not a production studio. It's a full-on gallery, hardwood floors, beautiful walls, fantastic lighting. And interestingly enough, the light we get at Home Depot. So it's not like they're anything special. They're just bought halogens. But the gallery looks phenomenal. And then we have a gallery at the Mall of America in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is our newest gallery. We opened that up uh, almost two years ago. And next December, not this coming one, but this December 2009, we open up at the MGM City Center in Las Vegas, which is the largest, most exclusive, highest-end product project that Las Vegas has ever seen. And it's supposed to rival the win which I'm sure Mr. Wynn would argue about, and it's supposed to rival the Bellagio. So this is basically the best of the best. There's only five galleries there, and they picked literally what they consider to be the best artists in their venue in the world. My neighbor is Dale Chihuly, the famous glass artist from Seattle. Wow. So business is doing well then. 
business is, and amazingly, everyone talks about how bad the economy is, and it is. But to me, things are returning to sort of what I would call pre-Bush levels. Gas is coming back down. My house value came back down. The stock market is trading no pre-Bush levels. Okay, so we just had eight years of a, uh, I say, time out, do over. Americans, if we got to go back eight years, we're really good at sucking it up and working our butts off to get back to where we need to be. And if that's what's happening, let's get it over with quick. But our gallery sales are actually up. I don't understand it. Maybe it's because people, they're not taking the trips. And instead of taking the trip, they're buying a piece to remind them of the trip that they would have taken. I don't know. But yeah, our sales are actually up. Well, you can't complain about that. Like you said, people are more discreet in their spending. And then, like you said, instead of going on that trip, they can buy this beautiful photo. To be honest, I'm humbled by it. I really am. Yeah, it's a great thing to see that sales are still going. So that's good because you you talk to a lot of other people and they're not. And your stuff's doing well. So this is great. Well, at least the orthodontics bill will get paid this month. (laughs) There you go, because you got to cover that huge rent from all the places that you're in. I couldn't even imagine the rent. You have no idea. You have no idea. I could buy a house in Iowa on 60 acres every year for what I pay at rent at just one of the locations. That's probably, you know, Pier 39. That's got to be crazy, 5,000 square foot. That's unbelievable. Well, you know what they say, you get what you pay for. That's right. Well, it's so true. Stop your crying and start your buying. So step it up. (laughs) (laughs) So, Rodney, I want to talk about your workshops. You do, what, maybe four or five a year, taking people out to some of these back areas and teach them how to do what you're doing. That's true. For the past 10, 11 years, I've done exactly that. And typically, they sell out before they're even advertised. However, in 2009, I'm taking a hiatus from it simply because we are opening the Las Vegas Gallery. And the free time that I had available to me is getting smaller and smaller and smaller the more galleries we open up. Maybe 2010. Wait and see. Well, there you go. Now, how often do you go to your galleries to sign stuff to see what's going on? Or is it like you have some key people in place and you can sort of be hands off with it? Or is it really hands-on gig? It's both. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have a group of incredibly competent and loyal, great people. And I'm going to say working with me, not for me. They work with me. And it is hands-on in that I'm watching to make sure that things are going the way they need to be. When questions get asked about something, I'm usually there to help answer it. Remember, my background, I spent seven, eight years in international direct mail marketing and working for some of the finest companies in the country, Bear Creek, which owns Harry and David and Jackson and Perkins Roses. I've been fortunate to have a background in marketing. I guess I'm doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing, and everything that came before it was prep work. Do you find that you can acquire managerial-type people in locations of the galleries, or are they trained and they come from the home base, and then you're sent out on a mission? No, actually, we can hire from the local pool of employees there are people that are available to work these kinds of positions. I'm very lucky in that the people who come to work at the galleries to help promote and sell my work, that they actually love the work. I think that's kind of paramount. If you didn't like where you were working or you didn't like what it was you were presenting marketing, why would you do it? And they absolutely love the work. Their passion and their love to make sure that they can help other people feel good in their lives. I mean, imagine coming home from a really horrible day at work, sitting in front of something that just makes you kind of go, ah, okay, life's not so bad. I mean, that's their job. It's not like we're selling nuclear waste here. I mean, these are things that make people feel good. Most people don't have such a job. No, no, they don't. What's looking forward here in the future for Rodney? You got some big trips coming up. I mean, of course, you got the new gallery at City Center that's going to be a huge gig, but Any big trips planned? I know that you hurt your leg recently and things are healing up there, but tell us about what you got planned coming up for 09. You got any big backpacking trips planned for something way out in the woods or what's going on? Well, you're right. I mean, I I was hiking in the Mount Timpanogos wilderness just about two months ago at the beginning of one of these three-month trips, actually, and a freak snowstorm came in, found myself in a whiteout, and I said, you know, it was just a day hike, and I said, well, I better turn around and get out of here literally turned around, rolled my foot on a little rock, snapped my fibula in five spots all by myself. And if I'd have been any further back, I probably would not have been able to easily hobble out like I did. So I'm in a cast right now. So there are no big plans right now. 
my big plans are in my head and dreaming of when does the cast come off and I can get back out in the field. I do leave this Wednesday to fly to the Mall of America Gallery. We'll be there this coming weekend. The Black Friday Thanksgiving weekend will be there. New things that have just happened, we just released a second Wilderness Collections Volume 2 coffee table book. It's a fantastic collection of some of my newest work. Selling like hotcakes, fantastic Christmas gift. Give it to anybody who loves wilderness or nature or landscape. I'm surprised at the number of photographers that are actually purchasing it. Luckily, I suppose all the tech info is in the back. Maybe there's something to be learned there. I don't know. That's a great question. What is next? I'm just concentrating on getting my ankle healed. That was a really, really bad break. And you know, as you might imagine, walking is kind of a requirement of the job. Right. So you got to make sure you're healed up very well. There's no use in chancing to have something not be healed just so you can go out and shoot more because I'm sure you have plenty of chrome waiting to be published. It's funny. One of my assistants was organizing film this last summer, and our graphics designer, when he got done, said, how much good film does Rodney got? And uh, he said, the world will never know how much <laughs> great film this guy's got sitting in the wings. Ironically, it's sitting in the wings because at the time I didn't think it was all that great. So maybe he saw something I didn't. I don't know. Well, I'm sure you have enough to keep things going. How often do you put out a new print? How often do you publish new work? Well, fortunately, I was lucky before I broke my ankle. I was uh, in the field for about three weeks, and I, I just came back with some really beautiful images. We're getting ready to release about three new ones here in the next couple of weeks. I would say that if I'm doing one every other month, I'm feeling pretty good. When I go out on a trip, if I come away with one good image out of every four, and then out of that, I come away with two or three just exceptional. And out of that, I get one that is like, oh my gosh, that just can't be real. I consider it very successful. So I'm getting a, a one in maybe 10 ratio of over the top, oh my gosh type images, but just solid, really beautiful ones, about one in every four. Yeah, that's really cool. So Rodney, let's give everybody information they can find out about getting a copy of your book. They can look at all your great work. They can find out where the galleries are to go look at the stuff. Maybe there's something on there where they can actually see where you're going to be somewhere again signing prints, and they can just go see what you're up to. That's right. You can visit our website, which is, my name is Rodney Lowe Jr., so I called my company The Low Road. It's not a gigantic stretch of the marketing imagination, I know, but it's cute, right? So the website is The Low Road, and it's T-H-E-L-O-U-G-H-R-O-A-D.com. And there's a press center, there's a what's going on in the galleries, there's a comments about the new book, all kinds of stuff on the website, where we're going to be, where we've been, searching facilities, you can look at all the images online. Yes, it's a great website. I'd go to the website. By all means, go to the website and buy something. There you go. <laughs> no, it's a great website. It is. It's beautiful. There's beautiful images up there, but I really think people need to go see your photography in person. They need to see a print that's mounted on a piece of board. It doesn't have glass behind it, like you said, and go look at it and just like, it's worth the trip. Well, thank you. Well, they can visit any of the galleries. If they live in the Midwest, the Mall of America, it's not that hard to get to. If you're on the West Coast, the, the Bay Area is not hard to get to. If you're in the Portland area, by all means, stop by for a visit. We'll be happy to show you around. Yeah, it's great stuff. Rodney, I really appreciate you joining us here today on Inside Analog Photo. We definitely look forward to talking to you again and just great photography and really cool work. Thanks, buddy. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, there you go. Rodney Lowe Jr. What a great photographer and a cool guy. Make sure you check his website out. Beautiful images over at the Low Road. That's L-O-U-G-H road dot com. You've been listening to Inside Analog Photo. I've been your host, Scott Shippard. And of course, the Inside Analog Radio Program was brought to you by Fujifilm over at FujifilmUSA.com forward slash professional. Richard Photo Lab at RichardPhotoLab.com, Upstrap at Upstrap-Pro.com, and our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group, www.apug.org. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.